No more thoughts and prayers. Grieving Americans demand gun control after the worst school shooting in the U.S. in a decade. But Congress has repeatedly failed to pass tougher laws. So, what's stopping action to prevent another tragedy? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mohammed Jamjoum. Mass shootings have been described as an epidemic that only happens in the United States. The Gun Violence Archive has already recorded 213 shootings this year. The latest killed 19 children and two teachers at an elementary school in the town of Uvalde in Texas. The worst school shooting in a decade took their lives just a few days before the start of the summer holidays. Police say the 18-year-old gunman sent chilling messages online before the attack and entered the school despite being confronted by a security guard. Grief in the tight-knit community is turning to anger as Americans once again demand tougher gun control laws. John Hendren reports from Uvalde. Another school massacre in America and more flowers to mourn the dead. Just before an 18-year-old Texas gunman massacred 21 people at Robb Elementary School on Tuesday, the governor says he shot his own grandmother. Anyone who shoots his grandmother in the face has to have evil in his heart. But it is far more evil for someone to gun down little kids. But the Republican governor's news conference devolved into political theater when his Democratic rival Beto O'Rourke interrupted to denounce decades of inaction in Congress and in Texas. You know, he, he talked about that this was evil. The only thing evil is what he continues to do to the people of this state. He says this was unpredictable. It was totally predictable, and I predict this will continue to happen. Syria Arizmendi is a teacher at another grade school, but her niece, Eliana, was a student at Robb Elementary School. She says it took hours before she learned that Eliana was among the dead. All we heard was whatever we saw on the phone, um, whether it was news or, or Facebook, or that's how we found, found out of the tragedy. We didn't find out about her until late last night, around 11.30. That's when they confirmed. Salvador Ramos, a high school dropout who for years was bullied in school for speaking with a lisp, bought two AR-15 style assault rifles shortly after his 18th birthday. Police say he carried one of them into the school, storming past an armed guard before firing more than 230 times over the course of a harrowing hour before Border Patrol agents gunned him down. I just don't understand how people could sell that type of a gun to a kid, to an 18-year-old. Like, what is he going to use it for? But for that purpose. Just what motivated Ramos is a question authorities are trying to answer now. Police are still scouring that scene and looking for a motive for what set that gunman off before he apparently shot his grandmother and then came here to Robb Elementary School. It was the second deadliest school shooting in American history, but political deadlock on gun control and a long and bloody history suggests it will not be the last. John Hendren, Al Jazeera, Uvalde, Texas. The deadliest school shooting happened 10 years ago when 20 children and six adults were shot dead at Sandy Hook Elementary School in Newtown, Connecticut. A Democratic senator from that state made this impassioned plea for Congress to pass stricter gun laws. But I'm here on this floor to beg, to literally get down on my hands and knees and beg my colleagues. Find a path forward here. Work with us to find a way to pass laws that make this less likely. I understand my Republican colleagues will not agree to everything that I may support, but there is a common denominator that we can find. All right, let's go ahead and bring in our guests in Baltimore. Dr. Joseph Sakran, a gun violence survivor and director of emergency general surgery at Johns Hopkins Hospital. In Doha, 
Jocelyn Sage Mitchell, Professor of American and Comparative Politics at Northwestern University in Qatar. And in Keene, New Hampshire, Richard Feldman, former regional political director at the National Rifle Association and author of Ricochet, Confessions of a Gun Lobbyist. A warm welcome to you all, and thanks so much for joining us on Inside Story today. Dr. Sekran, let me start with you today. The Gun Violence Archive has already recorded 213 shootings this year. That is shocking by any measure. Uh, you yourself are a survivor of gun violence. So I want to ask you what your initial reaction was when you learned about this, this latest horrific school shooting in Uvalde, Texas. Yeah, well, thanks so much for uh, having us on. And look, uh, I felt terrible this past week, as every American, frankly, should. Uh, because once again, we woke up in America with this recurring tragedy that continues to unfold time and time again. I'm absolutely horrified, I'm angry, and I'm frankly heartbroken. And I just refuse to believe that this is the best that we can do. Professor Mitchell, you know, the world has seen in the past that in other countries, when there have been mass shootings, lawmakers are able to come together and pass gun control measures. It happened in Scotland. It happened in Australia. What is stopping action on this in, in America, especially at a time when Americans have been demanding that their lawmakers do something about gun control? Why can this not be achieved? Thank you for the question, and thank you for having me. Um, I agree with our other presenters. This is a horrifying reason to be on this show, um, to again have to discuss another horrible tragedy uh, as an American, as a mother, as an educator. Uh, it's a very, very sad day once again for America. And um, your question about why have we not seen uh, legislative reform, especially with public opinion um, so strongly pushing for it, it's we have two um, major divisions in the US that are very difficult for us to overcome policy change in the national level, right? Um, first of all, I wanna be clear, I'm not the only person who thinks that what happened in Uvalde or what happens anywhere we see horrific gun violence, such as the racially motivated attacks just a week or so ago in Buffalo, uh, in California, right? But I'm not the only person who feels that this is wrong. 70% of Americans believe that um, we have a serious problem with gun violence in this country. But we are divided both on political partisan lines and divided based on our gun ownership. That, and those two divisions are making it very hard for us to decide how do we go forward. I mean, keep in mind that in terms of gun ownership in this country, we are very different than every other country in the world. The US has 400 million civilian owned guns in the country, and that's more than one gun per person, right? And um, yet that huge amount of guns, which is far more than any other country in the world, is held by only 30% of Americans. So we have about 30% of Americans who say they're mm -hmm. gun owners holding 400 million civilian owned guns. And both the Republican Democrat divide and the divide over the gun ownership combine to make it very difficult for us to, to, to agree on policy measures going forward. Richard, you wrote a piece in 2019 for Politico. This was after there had been shootings in California and Texas and Ohio. In this piece, you said, I believe there's a way to achieve meaningful, meaningful gun law reforms without alienating millions of responsible gun owners who don't believe that criminals, unsupervised children, or mentally ill people should have access to any kind of weapon. Meaningful gun law reforms did not happen then. Uh, do you think that this is something that can, that can actually happen now? And if so, how can it be achieved? Thank you. Um, yes, it can happen, but I think part of our problem in this country is that we talk around the issue and we use terms about the policy, but the real argument ends up being about the politics of the debate rather than the policy. Because if you ask gun owners or non-gun owners, we're all in agreement on who shouldn't have guns, uh, whether it's the um, uh, negligent misuse 
largely by children, the intentional criminal misuse, or uh, uh, someone with severe psychiatric problems, uh, dangerous psychiatric problems. None of us want those people to have guns. We can agree on that. And then we sort of go into this um, a deja vu loop and we start arguing about the politics involving the issue instead of focusing on how did this individual obtain the gun? What could we do to have prevent, better prevented that individual, that type of person from getting it? In this instance, you know, I think maybe we really do need to have a discussion. Uh, right now, under federal law, you have to be 21 mm. to be able to buy a handgun from a dealer, but only 18 for a long gun. Um, it's one of the easier things we could do mm. right now is uh, talk about that change. It would have had an impact uh, in Texas and in Buffalo because they were both 18-year-old shooters mm. who both bought their guns lawfully from dealers. All right, I, I want to bring up a reaction to the Uvalde shooting from a survivor of another school shooting that happened four years ago. David Hogg co-founded the March for Our Lives movement after 17 of his fellow students and teachers were killed in Parkland, Florida. He tweeted that he believes things will be different this time because... We voted out more NRA-backed politicians than ever before in American history and had the highest youth voter turnout in 2018 and 2020 in American history. We have the most pro-gun reform president and Congress in American history, plus the NRA is the weakest it's ever been. Republican state legislatures, including Florida, across the country have passed gun reform. We just need them to do it in Congress, even if it's small. No single policy will end every shooting but progress and reduction in gun violence is better than nothing. Dr. Sakran, um, David Hogg uh, said there that the NRA is the weakest it's ever been and that he believes things will be different this time. Do you agree? Do you believe that political ground is now shifting? Yeah, so look, I, I think there's a lot to unpackage there. The, the first that I would say is that it is very clear that the NRA is weaker, but I, I don't think that we should lose sight of still how powerful they are. I mean, their revenue is still in the hundreds of millions of dollars. And I wanna be clear, and this goes to Richard's point, is I don't think the problem are responsible gun owners. The problem is the leadership of the gun lobby does not represent the membership. And we have seen that through numerous pieces of data where the majority of gun owners and non-gun owners alike support common sense measures. I think the other piece that we have to really remember is that most governing in America happens at the local and state level. And we have seen hundreds of pieces of common sense gun legislation that have passed in states all across this country. The problem is we live in a country that has porous borders. So we need to see federal action in order to shore up you know, what's happening, not just through the mass shootings that we see in cities like Baltimore, we have young brown and black men that are being slaughtered on our streets. And it really requires, right, a multifaceted, multi-sector approach to tackle this problem, this complex public health problem. Uh, Professor Mitchell, I, I saw you just now uh, nodding along to a lot of what uh, Dr. Sakran was saying there. It looked like you wanted to jump in, so please go ahead. No, I... I agree very strongly with the last two statements that were made. There are some points of agreement on the federal level, bipartisan agreement for things such as saying people with mental health issues should not be allowed to buy guns and that we should strengthen background checks. Um, for the background checks, for example, 70% of Republicans and 90% of Democrats believe that we should have background checks and that would make a big difference because states that have robust background checks in place are shown that they have 60% less likelihood of these kinds of mass shootings. So that is the kind of federal level uh, you know, law that could make a big difference. Um, but although I appreciate the, the optimism of that tweet and um, I, I, I know where that person is coming from, unfortunately the structure of our federal government makes it so that even if public opinion is aligned, it's very hard to get those federal laws passed. Um, because as I, I, I wanna make clear to our audience, 
the Congress has two houses and the House of Representatives and the, the Senate both mm -hmm. have to pass the exact same bill to create that law. Mm -hmm. Now, the House of Representatives can just pass majority, but the Senate has to pass a supermajority, which means 60 out of 100 votes in order to pass that bill and have it become a law. And that's just because of the way the structure is set up. And so unfortunately, small, conservative, rural states mm -hmm. um, are represented by, by senators who can filibuster and prevent that bill from moving forward in the Senate, even if the vast majority of Americans, even if the majority of Republicans agree with these kinds of bills. Now, I hope that we are able to see some movement on the federal level, because I agree with our other presenter that we need this kind of across the board for mm -hmm. some of these basic uh, measures like background checks. But I also really like the attention paid to think about the state and local level. People who want to be a part of the change here, people who want to put their time and effort into making their communities, their schools, their churches, mm -hmm. their streets safer, they should look at their local and state level politicians, their voices and their impact can be so much greater at that level. And because we have a federal system, the states are able, as per the constitution, to create laws that really matter for the people, for the citizens and people living in those states. Mm -hmm. So that's also another place where we have to put our energy and efforts. Richard, uh, you just heard Professor Mitchell there talking about the difficulty of getting any kind of gun control legislation passed in the Senate and why that is the case. Earlier in the program, we showed some video of U.S. Senator Chris Murphy. He was literally begging his Republican colleagues. Uh, Chris Murphy, of course, uh, he's been a representative from a district. Uh, well, he was a representative from a district that included Sandy Hook Elementary School, where that 2012 mass shooting happened. In this video, he says he understands that his Republican colleagues will not agree to everything he may support, but that there is a common denominator that we can find. Um, what did you think when you when you saw that video? Do you think this will change minds? Uh, is there political willpower on behalf of Republicans in the Senate who would be willing and able to work with Senator Murphy and other Democratic lawmakers to actually pay, uh, you know, uh, pass some form of gun control legislation? In short, no, uh, I don't. Um, the politics of this issue really determines what's possible on the policy. And until we align the politics with the policy, um, I don't think we're going to see change at the national level. Um, you know, when I suggested changing the federal law to 21, I think that's in the realm of doability under the current system right now. Again, it's certainly not going to solve uh, a lot of the problems. But there are so many things we can do that do affect the day in and day out problems. Talking about a mass shooting, in, in a sense, uh, because it's newsworthy, naturally. But that's not where the bulk of the shootings in this country occur. Mm. And they're not as newsworthy, but there are far more of them in ones and twos, gang-related shootings, negligent shootings. There are many things we can do about those things. Sometimes they're not sexy, so they're not political. And nobody's interested, seemingly, in doing those things that aren't controversial. And if they're controversial, we have a fight. And that's the politics of this issue. Dr. Sekran, um, even if the Senate were somehow able to come together and pass some form of legislation that might include universal background checks, uh, I'm curious uh, to get your perspective on how long it might actually take for that to make a difference, for, for that type of law to, to be implemented, um, especially in a culture where so many mass shootings continue to happen. Yeah, well, I think it's important to remember, and, and we talked a little bit about this, and that is that it's not about implementing or passing one policy or one solution, right? Like any complex public health problem, this is going to require a multifaceted approach. And when you think about, for example, the structural racism, right, that we see in urban cities and that has created this vicious feedback loop, we have to also focus on understanding 
the, how poverty has limited opportunities to lead to increased crime, violence, incarceration, which of course further you know, results in poverty and weakens efforts to invest in communities. So this, it's not about passing just one piece of legislation. Mm. It really has to take a broad, comprehensive approach. And as we heard Professor Mitchell say, all of us have to be part of the solution. I think something that is, is often missed here is, do I think federal action is going to happen tomorrow? Probably not. But the reality is, is our country has changed. If you look back in 2008, we had around 63 Democrat members of Congress that had an A rating with the NRA. That number in 2018, it was somewhere around three and probably now it's close to zero. The point is, is that our country has shifted. Are we seeing it fast enough? No, because people continue to be slaughtered on our streets and communities all across this nation. And so inaction is just unacceptable. And we really need to think about the complexity of this problem and how we tackle it, all the different vantage points. And Dr. Sakran, I, I know that you, you touched on, on this a little bit earlier about, about how traumatic all, all of this is for, for survivors, for, for families, for the country. Uh, but I do want to take a, a step, uh, take a step back for a moment and, and sort of refocus uh, on that. Um, what what is a horrific experience like this do to a person? What does it do to to the survivors? What does it do to uh, relatives of those who who have been killed? It's absolutely devastating. I mean, you know, as someone who's a survivor, um, now I have to come to this discussion from a different vantage point as a trauma surgeon, and I can tell you that every time I have to walk into those waiting rooms. And to talk to those moms and dads and to explain to them that their child that left that morning is never coming home again. There's no more birthdays and graduations. They're left with simply the picture of their kid on the wall. And it is absolutely heart-wrenching and it never gets easier. And this is happening every day where healthcare professionals who are at the center of this discussion because we are not only taking care of these patients, but we're also having to talk to these families and to deliver just unimaginable news. It is just horrific and it's preventable. Richard, um, one of the things that's causing a lot of anger in the United States right now is the fact that the National Rifle Association um, has, has recommitted to holding its annual meeting in Houston, Texas this week. That's despite the mass shooting that happened in Uvalde, Texas. You are a former NRA regional political director. The fact that there cannot even be a moment when the NRA will step back from their stance, maybe cancel or delay this meeting, what do you think of that? Well, I think it has to do with other factors. They haven't had an annual meeting in three years because of COVID. Uh, they're in a state of internal uh, disarray. Uh, they had to go forward with their meeting. I think if the shooting had happened perhaps a week earlier, they might have uh, delayed it, but they're already there. They've been setting up for the last two days. It was really too late to even cancel it. Um, so, you know, I think it, it, it gives NRA more power than they've got to always focus on the NRA. When we talk about a third of the people in this country that own guns, um, what we're missing is that it's over half of the households in America uh, have, a, have someone in the household that owns a gun. Uh, it's not surprising that people that own guns care very much about the guns they own. After all, they didn't misuse those guns. Someone else did. And they feel that they're being blamed for something they didn't do. They want to blame the person who misused the gun as much as anyone. And it's having that broad understanding that gun owners actually are in large agreement with most of the orientation of keeping guns out of these people's hands. They need to be allies, not be demonized as the enemy, if we're going to move forward. 
All right. Well, we have run out of time, so we're going to have to leave our conversation there today. Thanks so much to all of our guests, Dr. Joseph Sakran, Jocelyn Sage Mitchell, and Richard Feldman. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. For me, Mohammed Jamjoum, and the entire team here in Doha, bye for now.